The stars have not dealt me the worst they could do. My pleasures are plenty, my troubles are too. I'll never be cultured or decently fed with holes in my stomach and string in my head. So reads the caption of a punch cartoon titled Portrait of the Artist, Miss Barbara Hepworth, executed by Quentin Blake in 1954. The cartoon features a contented Hepworth stringing together the two curved ends of a hollowed out wooden form, surrounded by curling wood shavings and several of her sculptures, all sporting her characteristic piercings or strings. The accompanying poem, a humorous version of an untitled work by A. E. Hausman, completes Blake's portrait of Hepworth by suggesting that, like her sculptures, she too is distinguished by holes in her stomach and string in her head. Though meant as a quippy punchline, the poem also serves as a pithy observation, alluding to Hepworth's artistic process and sensibility. Throughout her life, Hepworth sustained an intense bodily relationship with her work. Like most sculptors, she connected with materials through touch, using her hands to translate her experience of being in the landscape into sculptural form. Beyond this, however, Hepworth expressed a desire to transcend the boundaries of materiality, to become one with her work, asking, could I, at one and the same time, be the outside as well as the form within? Recognizing Blake's cartoon as a reflection of this desire, Hepworth included it in her pictorial autobiography, which she published in 1970. Barbara Hepworth's fascination with the interaction of the body with the landscape and how that experience might be translated into sculpture became central to our artistic production in the 1940s after her move from Hampstead to St. Ives in 1939. Consequently, Hepworth formulated what she termed the stereognostic sense, a process which engages the tactile and visual senses as a means to perceive the experience of the body in the landscape and articulate it through the formal elements of sculpture. For Hepworth, the stereognostic sense gives primacy to the tactile over the visual and auditory senses, establishing a hierarchical relationship among them. The preeminence of the tactile sense effectively disrupts language as the primary signifying system. However, this hierarchy is disrupted and inverted through the process of display, which necessitates new methods of communicating Hepworth's stereognostic sense to the viewer enabling them to empathize with the artist's embodied perception of the landscape. Thereby, Hepworth's stereognostic sense not only shapes her own method of creation, but the viewer's mode of experience, and in doing so reveals underlying tensions between the tactile and the visual. Barb Hepworth's conception of the stereognostic sense can be understood as a form of embodied perception that moves beyond mere visual perception to include the tactile. Hepworth was first cited using her notion of the stereognostic sense in a text published in the accompanying catalog for her 1954 retrospective at the Whitechapel Gallery in London, which was later published in 1962 in a catalog for another exhibition of her work at the same venue. It was here that she defined it as the ability to feel weight and form and assess its significance. According to the Oxford English Dictionary, stereognostic is defined as pertaining to the mental apprehension of the forms of solid objects by touch. When applied to Hepworth's carving, it can be understood as a synesthetic process. Hepworth's stereognostic sense uses touch to translate the association and meaning of gesture and landscape, as she puts it. Gesture, in this case, can be considered form. The primacy of touch in this process allows Hepworth to circumvent language, which she finds insufficient to translate her experience of being the landscape into form. It is difficult to describe in words the meaning of forms, she writes, because it is precisely this emotion which is conveyed by sculpture alone. In other words, Hepworth's stereognostic sense represents the interconnectivity among the human figure through touch 
carved form, and landscape. Though Hepworth's Serenostic sense was not formally conceived until the 1950s when she publicly coined the term, this process applies most readily to her works created the decade before. When the sculptor moves to St. Ives, she becomes fascinated with the relationship between the body and the landscape, a fixation which is encapsulated by her sculptures of the 1940s. For a few years, wrote Hepworth in 1951, reflecting on the past decade, I became the object. I was the figure in the landscape and every sculpture contained a greater or lesser degree, the ever-changing forms and contours embodying my own response to a given position in the landscape. Hepworth's declaration, I became the object, emphasizes the extent to which her sculptures of this period came to embody her experience in the Cornish landscape. This embodiment is best visualized in a photo montage created by George Lewinsky in 1963 which superimposes a portrait of the artist over selected images of her sculptures. Hepworth, who was particular not only about her own photographic representation, but that of her sculptures, was elated, writing to Lewinsky, I think this montage of photographs is quite the most real representation I've ever had. It is so close to both my sculpture and my drawings. In Lewinsky's photo montage, Hepworth's body and hands fade seamlessly into the background, blending into the curved arm of Pelagos from 1946, which guides the viewer's eyes into the pierced center of image two from 1960 and the tangled web of Orpheus from 1956, creating the illusion of a single unified body. Hepworth is her sculptures and the sculptures are in turn an extension of her replicating the sentiment of Blake's portrait of the artist. Further, the dimensional quality of the image created through the delicate rendering of curved forms and depth success successfully reproduced complex three-dimensional forms on a two-dimensional picture plane, a feat Hepworth struggled to achieve in her own photographic practice. Using photo collage, she pasted photographs of her work in idealized outdoor settings in an attempt to counter the flattening effects of a white background in gallery photographs. Nevertheless, the introduction of the photograph into the viewer's perception of her sculptures interrupts the stereognostic process by removing the ability to touch and flattening the sculptural form. Consequently, Hepworth found this method insufficient to capture the embodied experience communicated by her sculptures and she rarely photographed her work after 1950. Hepworth's photographic experimentations and enthusiasm for Lewinsky's portrayal of dimensionality reveals the necessity of sculptural form, as well as the viewer's immediate access to sculpture's primary elements of color and line, molded through the artist's touch to communicate the embodied experience of being in the landscape. In essence, her carvings came to realize her experiences in the landscape and as such became anthropomorphized. Touch was the key that allowed Hepworth sculptures to reach this anthropomorphic state and interpret her sensation of being in the landscape into form. Hepworth attributed special significance to her hands as the primary point of tactile sensory experience. In her pictorial autobiography, she included several photographic studies of her hands in the process of creating a new work or caressing a finished one. One such image depicts her left hand gently caressing a length of stone, while her right hand traces a pencil around its circumference, indicating where she will carve. Though such an emphasis was common practice for sculptors, Hepworth's hands and the tactile sense hold a particular function in how she places herself in relation to the world. The artist explains, the right is only a motor hand. This holds the hammer. The left hand, the thinking hand, must be realized, sensitive. The rhythms of thought pass through the fingers and grip of this hand into the stone. Hepworth's thoughts and the stone are connected through her left hand, which communicates through touch, 
In other words, Hepworth's body serves as the translator between form and her perceived experience of being the landscape. However, it is worth noting that while the tactile is foreground in Hepworth's stereognostic process, it does not exclude the visual, which remains a crucial interconnective element. Of her carving process, the author writes, there was the sensation of moving physically over the contours of fullness and concavities, through hollows and over peaks, feeling, touching, seeing, through mind and hand and eye. This sensation has never left me. I, the sculptor, am the landscape. I am the form and I am the hollow, the thrust and the contour. The hierarchy adopted in her practice is replicated here, where she prioritizes the tactile sense over the visual, seemingly listing the senses in the order necessitated by her stereognostic process. By including sight in addition to touch in the means of perception through which Hepworth both experiences the landscape and translates it into sculpture, the stereognostic process becomes a full body phenomenon in which sensorial experience is interconnected through mind and hand and eye. Hepworth's stereognostic sense can then be perceived as a form of embodied perception as understood in phenomenological discourses. Rachel Smith proposes that phenomenologist Maurice morlot ponties idea about the perception of nature and Hepworth's physical experience of the landscape and sculpture are to some extent socially, culturally, and historically bound to one another. Merleau-Ponty's Phenomenology of Perception was published in French in 1945 and translated into English in 1962. In his influential book, Merleau-Ponty built on the Gestaltist philosophy that perception is a process grounded in the physical world and suggested that sensory experience occurred within the body, emphasizing the need for contact between the body and its surroundings. Furthermore, he asserts that seeing integrates itself with the tactile dimensions of experience as upon seeing something that the object registers as something to be touched or physically responded to. Therefore, like Hepworth's stereognostic sense, Merleau-Ponty interprets sight as deferent to the tactile. In this way, phenomenology can be seen to reflect Hepworth's stereognostic sense which interlinks the hand and eye in its translation of the landscape, becoming an experience of embodied perception. As Hepworth does when she translates her embodied perception into sculpture, Merleau-Ponty takes the experience of embodied perception outside of the confines of the body, theorizing that bodies carry international threads which link them to their surroundings. Therefore, when the body perceives a landscape, and so the whole body experiences it, it feels that it can inhabit it. That is to say, embodied perception as theorized by Merleau-Ponty and as expressed by Hepworth's stereognostic process goes beyond the hierarchical integration of the visual and the tactile to create a holistic sensorial experience, which allows the body to assume unity with its surroundings. I, the sculptor, am the landscape. Hepworth's stereognostic sense foregrounds the tactile and the artist's bodily re relationship to the sculpture. Touch, as Hepworth notes, is a fundamental sensibility which comes into action at birth. As such, it is one of the first ways the human form engages with the world. Her work proposes a radical reversal of the primacy of the visual and auditory senses, which due to their association with language, the primary signifying system, normally surpasses the tactile during the subject's acquisition of language. However, in Hepworth's preoccupation with naming her works, her reliance on language as a signifying system with which to communicate her stereognostic sense to the viewer can be seen. As her own relationship with her art is primarily a stereognostic one, Hepworth, from as early as 1943, often turned to her friend, art writer E.H. Ramston, to help her title her works. In a letter dated around that time, Hepworth wrote to Ramston, I'm more than ever convinced that the right title is absolutely necessary to me. Can you help me 
I've forgotten all my Greek now and haven't a dictionary. I know the feeling and intention of each carving, but the exact words are elusive. It was only in the 1940s that Hepworth began naming her works rather than attributing purely descriptive titles to them, suggesting the importance of language to translating the stereognostic sense, which characterized the sculptures of this period to a wider audience. In other words, while the stereognostic sense translated Hepworth's embodied experience into sculpture, the sculptures required a further level of translation to complete the transfer of experience to the viewer. Language's function as a translator becomes even more crucial for those of her works, like Pelagos, which are displayed in a glass vitrine or are cordoned off from the public, thereby eliminating the possibility of touch. Hepworth always endorsed fewer interaction with her sculpture to truly connect with it on a tactile level. She wrote, one of the things that pleased me most after my recent show was to observe when my work came back from St. Ives, came back to St. Ives, how much the pieces had been touched by visitors to the exhibition. Even when the possibility of the tactile interaction is removed, Hepworth directs the viewer towards a stereognostic reading of her sculptures and completes the translation of her embodied experience through language. For example, Ramsden assisted with the naming of Hepworth's 1946 sculpture Pelagos. This work is compromised of a spherical wooden form whose center has been painted blue and carved to create the illusion of a continual spiral whose arms curl, suspended in min air, and strung together. The word Pelagos is Greek for sea and instantly directs the viewer towards the interpretation of Pelagos as a wave or perhaps a body of water enveloped by land represented by a wooden outer shell. Of Pelagos, the artist had said it reflects the view out of her studio window where the horizon of the sea was enfolded by the arms of the land to the left and the right of me, as she writes. Pelagos is what the artist terms a closed form, a round structure which envelops an internal space that the artist uses to translate her feeling of being in the landscape into sculptural form. Once read as water, the closed form of Pelagos guides the viewer towards an understanding of the curves of the sculpture as arms enveloping the inner core, inviting them in visually. The primary elements of Pelagos, namely color, line, and form, continue to guide the viewers to an embodied perception of the work by placing sculpture as the medium through which to reintegrate the body, even in its moment of linguistic abstraction. While language leads the viewer towards an embodied perception of Hepworth sculpture, it also abstracts it by signifying its meaning through a system of letters and words. The viewer's perception truly becomes embodied through the formal elements of the sculpture which invite the viewer into and to become the work. Many of Hepworth sculptures from the 1940s are distinguished by the use of color, normally a pale blue or white, lining the punctured areas of the sculptural form, as in Pelagos. Hepworth notes color's ability to establish the mood of place and time embodied by the sculpture. In this work, pale blue evokes associations with the color of the sea and the feeling of serenity which comes with its cool tones. Moreover, the paint provides a sharp contrast to the rich wood color of the sculpture's exterior and immediately signifies the interior of the sculpture as something apart, drawing attention to its form and depth. By artificially illuminating the shaded interior, the shadows cast by the arms of the sculpture are emphasized, drawing attention to the insideness of the surface and making this interior space accessible, thereby drawing the viewer in. Penelope Curtis notes that the painted surface can also read as an exterior or shell to the exposed wood surface from which it appears to be peeled back. This duality brings forth the tension between exterior and interior, reflecting the stereognostic quality of Hepworth sculptures in the internal embodied perception is translated into a form existing in the exterior physical world. This process, 
though guided initially by linguistic signification, mimics the sensory hierarchy embodied by the stereognostic sense. Color, as something perceived visually, facilitates the translation of Hepworth's stereognostic sense to the viewer by highlighting the interiority and exteriority of the work, thereby drawing attention to its form and registering it as a three-dimensional tactile object. This tension between interior and exterior is further illustrated by the stringing of the work, which often accompanies painted surface and hepper sculptures, as seen in the Pelagos, as well as Wave from 1943 to 1944. The strings in Pelagos pulled taut between the two curved arms of the sphere creates a series of parallel lines that seem to pull them together. Similarly, the strings and wave radiate from the bottom arm of the sphere out towards the interior of the opposite side, as if trying to pull the arm closer and seal the puncture in the sculpture's center. The lines pierce through the painted surface to the exposed wood and loops back in, interconnecting the interior and exterior and binding them together. In a draft for an essay on Hepworth sculpture, Ramsden wrote that the dissolving curves of the interior and exterior surfaces, the stringing and the inner tensions of them, configures whole that a sense of the cosmic rhythm of life which transcends all forms through which it is given. Here, Ramsden describes how the stringing together of interior and exterior comes to signify the embodied experience of life. In the case of Pelagos and Wave, the tension of the stringing represents the tension the artist felt with the elements of the land and sea in the Cornish landscape, represented by the painted and wooden surfaces. While the viewer is guided to this understanding through their titles, the formal elements of the sculpture transmit this meaning through their stereognostic qualities to be perceived visually and ideally tactically by the viewer. The pierced holes which feature in much of Hepworth's 1940s works are also crucial to the viewer's perception of them. Pendor from 1947 was inspired by Pendor Cove in Cornwall and was carved from the locally sourced wood. The piercings in its sides which curve in away from the browned wood surface reflect the contrast between the form one feels within oneself sheltering near some great rocks or reclining in the sun on the grass-covered rocky shapes which make the double spiral of Pendor or Zenner Cove, as Hepworth writes. In a similar way that the colored plane of the interior invites the viewer into the carved space of the sculpture, the holes in Pendor guide the viewer in, allowing what Hepworth terms bodily entry and re-entry. Though in the case of Pendor, this is taken metaphysically, when Hepworth um, later began working on life-size sculptures, she encouraged visitors to climb in and over them, and is often photographed demonstrating this, as in this 1961 image taken by Ida Carr of the artist protruding from curved form, Trevlagon, from 1956. These holes incorporate negative space into the wood form, integrating mass and space together, and in this way, making the surrounding environment visible through these holes, part of the overall composition so that the sculpture is locked into referencing the universe of which it is a part. This sentiment complements that of Hepworth's photo collages, which strove to contextualize her work within the landscape rather than the white cube of the gallery space. In this way, the sculpture seems to embody its environment by absorbing it into its composition mirroring the stereognostic sense as a form of embodied perception. Therefore, by entering into the sculpture visually through these piercings, the viewer can coalesce with the sculpture in the same way, reintegrating the experience of the sculpture away from the linguistic abstraction and into embodied perception. Though later works by Hepworth may reflect elements of this perceptual process, the named, rather than descriptively titled, works from the 1940s particularly reflect the notions encompassed by the stereognostic sense due to their incorporation of language as a system of signifying meaning and the formal elements of color, line, and form 
which translate this meaning from abstract symbols of language to an embodied perception that mimics Hepworth's own. In this way, Hepworth's stereognostic sense and her use of language to communicate it to a broader audience refashions the role of the linguistic in perception. Rather than functioning as the primary and often final lens through which to interpret perceived experience, it becomes one in a series of translations, encouraging the engagement of all the senses and signification systems of perception. Hepworth sculptures function as a realization of this multifaceted perception. The tensions between their interiority and exteriority mirrored in their relationship with the surrounding environment encourages the making and remaking of perceptions. Just as their form transforms when perceived simultaneously through linguistic, visual, and ultimately tactile lenses, so shifts the viewer perception of them. In this way, each of the signifying systems occupies and is dictated by its own temporality. Hepworth's stereognostic sense then poses the reintegration of a tactile temporality cast off with the acquisition of language into our daily perceptive experience. Her sculptures offering a glimpse into an alternate embodied reality. In this way, this process and the sculptures it produces create an argument for a new way of interacting with art that challenges conventions of display. Is it enough to allow viewers full visual access to a work if it sits behind a vitrine or is marked by the directive, do not touch? Do such barriers truncate a viewer's experience of Hepworth sculptures as she suggested of her photo montages? Or are her use of language, form, color, and line and their ability to guide viewers towards a stereognostic reading a sufficient substitute for the tactile? If the artist creates with stereognostic sense, perhaps it is time to lift the glass, pull back the velvet rope and make room for a new embodied perception. Thank you for listening. I'm extremely grateful to have been honored as this year's recipient of the Sir Dennis Mullen Essay Prize.